So I am here today with Sebastian Buback, who leads the Machine Learning Foundations Group at Microsoft Research Redmond. He joined MSR in 2014 after three years as an assistant professor at Princeton University. Um, among many things, uh, I think Sebastian is uh, becoming especially well known for uh, some of the recent work that he's done, including a paper called The Sparks of AGI, which was one of the first studies to try to understand what's going on inside of GPD-4. Uh, and uh, we're here today to talk a little bit about some of the work that you've done more recently than that on this uh, pretty exciting new model called Phi, uh, and in particular, the Phi 2 release of this series of models that you've been working on. So I thought maybe we could start by you explaining a little bit about uh, what Phi is. You wrote a paper about it called uh, Textbooks Are All We Need. Uh, and so like, maybe we can start there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Hi, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad to explain uh, the journey that went into building those uh, Phi models. So this started right after we finished the Sparks of AGI paper, which in my view, what we discovered there is that really there is something that at least resembles intelligence in GPT-4. And once we made that, once we had this realization, it became very natural for us to ask the following question. Okay, so OpenAI demonstrated that if you go with scale, you build a very, very large model, you train it for a long time with a, a lot of data, you get intelligence. But what are exactly are the minimal ingredients that are needed for this intelligence to emerge? So this is the beginning of the Phi journey, is what are the minimal ingredients for artificial intelligence in the form of GPT-4 to emerge? Um, of course, my team, you know, we're, we're a team mostly of, of theoreticians and we didn't have much experience with training LLMs directly. So we needed to start right at the very, very beginning. And so we thought to start, we're going to try to build an LLM that can code. And why did we choose coding? So this was a Phi 1 project uh, back in April. And why did we choose code? We chose code because code is very well defined. It's very well scoped, you know. In particular, it's easy to produce data to train those models. And it's also easy to evaluate. So that's what we, we did first. And this is where we wrote this uh, textbooks are all you need paper, where basically the observation is quality of the data matters perhaps even more than we thought. So of course, the fact that data quality matters is obvious to anyone who has worked in machine learning, you know, who has paid attention at all. And data cleaning is something that People in the ML community have spent a lot of time doing to produce, you know, better model way before LLMs. But we went, we went kind of to the extreme. We said, no, it's not only about cleaning the data, making it nice, etc. It's actually about going for data which is of textbook quality. And what we mean by that, I don't want to confuse the listeners. Uh, we didn't actually train on literal textbooks. What we did is that we leveraged the power that is offered to us by the GPT models to create synthetic textbooks. So this is what we did back with Phi 1. We wrote synthetic textbooks about coding and we trained the model on those synthetic textbooks. And what we discovered is that suddenly, if you have this textbook quality data, you're able to train much, much, much smaller models. So Phi 1 was a 1 billion uh, parameters model. And so the thing that I've always liked about this approach uh, is that it matches an intuition that I have about how biological intelligence works, or at least their experience over the past few centuries uh, you know, with um, like how you educate a biological intelligence. Like you don't just throw whatever random uh, information that's available to like a child when you're trying to teach them like how to become better at mathematics or better at biology or chemistry, uh, you like give them the highest quality information that you possibly can in, in like a particularly structured curriculum. Uh, and, and so like, I, I think it's kind of an obvious thing to say because it matches all of our experience, but uh, you know, somehow or another, it's been a little bit counterintuitive for people in uh, in machine learning because it's been so much about uh, just like get all the data and 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 throw it at an algorithm and like things will work out. Yeah, I I agree a hundred percent with what you said, but maybe I can explain a little bit why the ML community maybe was confused around those uh, topics a little bit. 
And to explain, I can talk about Phi 1.5, which was our model in between Phi 1 and Phi 2. So Phi 2 is our you know, most recent release, which is really getting close to a GPT 3.5 uh, level of model, except that it's only 2 billion uh, parameters. But in between moving from the coding model to Phi 2, we had this uh, intermediate point, Phi 1.5, where we tried to do what we did for coding, but now do it for common sense reasoning. And common sense reasoning, you get into something much more delicate because there are no textbooks for common sense reasoning. Common sense reasoning is what we as human beings we acquire by interacting with the world, by going around our business every day, by talking to people as a child, by interacting with your parents, etc. So it's not that simple to think about what kind of textbook would you write to teach somebody common sense. So you are totally correct when you say that when we teach you know, a child, we think very carefully about the curriculum, how we're going to you know, show the elements. But there is some basic foundation that all the human beings share. And teaching this basic foundation is a little bit different. You have to think about it almost as if you were teaching an alien that had just landed on Earth. You know, what would you have to explain to them so that they could understand the basics of human interaction? And that's what we did. And we, we still went for the textbooks are all you need approach. But, but in that case, thinking about it as textbooks is maybe a little bit counterintuitive from our human experience. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think one of the interesting things to underscore here, and we'll talk about Phi 2 in just a second, is that, um, yeah, when you think about a foundation model, um, you know, I think people think about them mostly as, uh, you know, they're sort of foundations for building AI applications. So. Mm -hmm. GitHub Copilot, Microsoft 365 Copilot, like all of the amazing things that startups are out there doing right now. But like they also serve as a foundation for research. Uh, so Phi wouldn't be possible without uh, like the pre-existence of like one of these frontier uh, foundation models to help uh, help do what needs to be done to like build uh, build a, a, a thing like Phi. Absolutely. So there is. So I want to make two points on, on what you just said. Uh, the first one is, yes, the Phi models, they would simply not be possible without something like GPT 3.5 and in fact, Phi 2 without GPT 4. GPT 4 was used also for Phi 2. And the second point that I want to make about the connection with research is this is one of the key points of the Phi series of models, is that we want to enable more research on LLMs and on language models in general. And the small size of the yeah. five models makes it perfect for many, many studies, including mechanistic interpretability, improvement over safety, various fine tuning experiments. All of those things are much more readily available when you're talking about a 1 billion or 2 billion parameters models than the bigger ones. So look, I, I, uh, I think in general, um, the reason I do what I do, and I suspect it's pretty similar with you, is uh, like I want to, I want to always explore the curiosity that we all have to like really sort of better understand why uh, why complicated systems like these uh, modern AIs work the way that they work, and like how far you can use those new understandings to push capabilities. But the bigger thing that I, I just powerfully care about is building a platform with these AI tools that allow people to do unbelievable, exciting, uh, you know, transformative new things. Um, and, and so like, you know, one of the exciting things that's going on right now is like we, you know, we have this unbelievably great partnership with OpenAI and like they are doing unbelievably great work and like we will continue to invest in them, at the, you know, just almost unimaginable scale of compute to like build this series of powerful frontier models. Uh, but there is so much to do for this vision of allowing people to really go build these powerful things with AI, uh, where you have to have these innovations like, like Phi and prompt base and like, and, and the dozens of other things that we and other people are going to discover. Like that's the thing that's, you know, super exciting. Uh, it's like just the rate of discovery of these new techniques. It's just incredible. 
No, I mean, I, I feel very lucky to be living in this era and to be, you know, having my scientific career at the moment of a revolution like the one we're witnessing. You know, I was always, you, you talked about the Feynman integrals before. I was always longing for, you know, the scientists of the 1920s. Of course, the people of the 1920s, they had other problems. But at least the scientists of the 1920s, it was incredible, it was incredible the moment they were living in, you know, just on the heels of general relativity, then they were discovering quantum mechanics. I mean, how amazing is that? And, and you know, in, at the beginning of my career, it was fun. It was exciting and machine learning was making a lot of progress. But then suddenly there was this breaking point, which I really feel is closely connected, at least spiritually, to the difference between classical mechanics and quantum yeah. mechanics. It's really the same thing. And there is so much to discover. It's, it's really, really great. And to be able to do it with partners like OpenAI is just a gift of God, honestly. It's amazing. Yeah. My, my hope uh, for mathematics and for other scientific disciplines uh, as well, but, but I think this is really, really especially true for mathematics, is you have things like Fermat's Last Theorem, which is beautiful. Um, but I'm not sure that it has much utility beyond its beauty. <laughs> and yes. I, I think if you have powerful tools that let you explore more of this mathematical beauty, then like you, you enrich our human experience. Um, like not all mathematics needs to be utilitarian and like having more of this non-utilitarian mathematics because you have more powerful tools allowing like some of these more beautiful areas of mathematics uh, to be explored. Like, I think is it going to be a good thing? Yeah, it, it, it's, I mean, the, you know, more generally the fact that one of the first things that AI went after and really improved human beings at is art. That's, you know, beautiful in the first place. We don't even need to go to mathematics, just, you know, visual arts right now is being transformed with AI. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 amazing. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you so much for taking a few minutes uh, to chat today. I know you're <laughs> very busy uh, doing a whole <laughs> bunch of like very interesting things, uh, but like this was a great conversation, and uh, like I'm glad we'll be able to share it with folks. Yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot, Kevin. It was super fun.